He's a merciful God. You know, you think about that story over in uh, John chapter 8, I believe it is. A woman taken in adultery. And uh, no doubt she was guilty. Never any argument whether she was guilty or not. But uh, they brought her to Jesus. And Jesus said, Let he that is among you without sin cast the first stone. <coughs> Guilty woman, according to the law, she was supposed to die. And the Bible says they left from the elders to the youngest. But you know, if you think about that thing, there was one there that was worthy to cast that first stone. Jesus could have picked up a stone and killed that woman and by the law been right doing it. But he stayed his hand. How many times has he stayed his hand with you and I? We think about all the things he's worthy to do. What about the things that he's worthy to do that he hasn't done? Man, I tell you, he's a good God. <laughs> he is a good God. Exodus chapter 12 this morning. It's good to see everyone. Continue to remember the pastor and those that are sick can't be with us. Continue to remember little Joseph. Is the Lord still helping him? Uh, we thank God for the doctors and the nurses, but we're relying on a great physician, right? Exodus chapter 12 this morning, verse number 1. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door, upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover." For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. I preach a few minutes this morning on your lamb. Brother D'Angelo, you pray for us, brother. Help us, Lord. Here we have uh, verses 1 and 2. God's doing a new thing. You study this thing out. Actually, when he's speaking, this is the third month. 
And God's saying from this point forward, this is going to be the first month to you. He's changing the months around. You say, can he do that? Well, he's God. I expect he can. Uh, it didn't matter what they said. It was done. Uh, you know, you think about that thing, and it's, it's kind of like salvation. God said it was done, and it didn't make sense, and they couldn't see how it's going to happen. But when he said it, it happened. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When you get saved, there's a change. And it doesn't matter what anybody else said about it. Uh, you get saved and people, oh, he'll be back in just a few months and nothing happened. He'll be back to the same old thing. But when God saves someone's soul, a new thing takes place. And if God knows it and you know it, then you know what? It is what it is. It doesn't matter what the world say. Time will tell. People will see and people will know, but the fact of the matter is if you're born again by the grace of God, nothing is going to undo that. The Bible says, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right, speaking evil of you. When you get saved, God does a work. It's a new work. There's a new man on the inside. And that new man that's on the inside begins to manifest itself on the outside. Uh, so many people, so many religions have worked the opposite way. Right? Let's get this fixed and this fixed and this fixed. It doesn't work that way. Salvation takes place on the inside of a person. It is a spiritual transaction. Will it manifest itself on the outside? It should. But here God is. He's doing a new thing. And look what it all begins with. Look at verse 3. Exodus 12 and 3. The Bible says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, in the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb. That's how it began. It began with a lamb. Just like your salvation began with a lamb. Uh, people try to make out like water baptism is salvation. People try to make out like church membership is salvation. Thank God for church membership. Uh, if you're born again and don't have a home church, you need to get involved with a Bible-believing church. But it's not salvation. Salvation begins with the lamb, just like here. That's how it all occurred. God told Abraham to take his only begotten son on that mountain and sacrifice him. And, and Abraham took Isaac. They began to walk up that mountain. And Isaac asked Abraham, he said, where's the sacrifice? You know what Abraham said in Genesis 22? He said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. You know what God did? He provided himself a sacrifice. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and I hung on that cross. That was more than a man. He was 100% man, but he was 100% God also. God hung on that cross and shed his blood and gave his life that you and I, whosoever will, the Bible says, can be born again. It all began with the lamb. Thank God for the lamb. Look at verse number four with me. The Bible says, And if thy household be too little for the lamb. Do you know that the lamb's never too little for the household? <laughs> the lamb's always enough. I don't care if it's you by yourself. I don't care if you are ma and pa cattle and got 40 children. The lamb's enough, amen. The lamb's enough. The lamb is always enough for the house. Maybe a widow or a widower and spent your life with someone and now they're gone, gone home to heaven and you miss them and, you know, everything's all right when it's daytime and people are around and you can get out and do, but you lay down in the bed at night, you know what happens? I imagine that old house that's pretty small during the day, I imagine that thing gets pretty big at nighttime. But I tell you, I don't care how big it gets, it don't get bigger than the lamb, amen. Yeah. Joseph said, where is my God that giveth me songs in the night? I tell you, the lamb's always enough. 
The lamb's enough of that loneliness. You raising children. Who knows it's hard to raise children? Anybody know that? If you don't know that, it's because you ain't got no children. It's hard to raise children. And they're all different. And one of them's sweet. And one of them's mean. And one of them, that dude's just crazy. I don't know what we're going to do with him. He is, they something wrong with that dude. And you lay there and you think, how are we going to do it? How are we going to help them understand about Jesus? How are we going to lead them to the Lord and they can be saved? And you just think it looks like sometimes it's almost insurmountable. Your house, how it's going to happen. Can I tell you the land's big enough for the household? Can I tell you, if you lead them and train them and lead them to Jesus Christ, that he'll take care of the rest, amen. Can I tell you the lamb's big enough for the house? I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what your circumstances are, but the lamb is big enough for the house. Nothing. Listen to what I'm telling you. Nothing is too big for the lamb. Nothing. Look at verse number five with me. The Bible says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Uh, not just any lamb would do here. It had to be a lamb without blemish. It had to be the best one they could find in order for it to suffice. God didn't send Michael the archangel. He ain't sent Gabriel. God sent the best he could find, amen. Who was that? That was his only begotten son. He didn't send the angels. He didn't send the patriarchs. He didn't send the old saints. God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to be the lamb. Now, these lambs, they were sacrificed for thousands of years under the legal dispensation. Sacrifices, sacrifices, sacrifices. But you know what? They had to keep sacrificing. Why? Because the sacrifice wasn't perfect. The lambs were not perfect. Uh, John the Baptist and some of his disciples, they saw Jesus one day walking. And the disciples saw Jesus. They saw the man but John the Baptist, with his spiritual discernment, he saw a little bit deeper. He looked and when he saw Jesus, he didn't just see a man. John the Baptist saw him and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. John the Baptist saw more than a man. He saw the Lamb. He knew it was the Lamb they had been looking for that the other lambs would no longer be necessary when this lamb, the perfect lamb, God's lamb, lamb would offer himself up as a sacrifice. Hold your place here. We're coming back. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to come right back here, but I want to read you some scripture. Hebrews chapter number 9, talking about the lamb this morning. Talking about your lamb this morning. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. Look at verse number 11. Speaking of Jesus Christ here. Hebrews 9 and 11 says, But Christ, being come at high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. If under that legal dispensation, that lamb and that bull and that goat was accepted, 
how much more shall the pure, sinless, holy blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, cleanse our sins? I tell you, it's always been about the Lamb, and even right now as we see it right here today, it's about the Lamb. Not just any Lamb. It's not about a little animal. It's not about a sacrifice anymore. It's about the sacrifice that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, made on that cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. If you're born again here this morning, it's because you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you're lost here this morning, why won't you let today be the day of salvation? That Lamb gave his life for you that you might be born again. Turn back to uh, Exodus chapter 12. Speaking about the lamb this morning. And we're comparing this lamb, this Passover, to Jesus Christ, the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Look at Exodus 12, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Pilate had Jesus there and was trying to let him go. You know what those Jews said? But they cried saying, crucify him, crucify him. They desired Barabbas, a murderer, rather than Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. You know what a sacrifice has to do? A sacrifice has got to die. That's biblical. That's why hardly anyone wants to sacrifice, right? This is 21st century America. We don't mind sacrificing as long as it doesn't cost us anything. That's not exactly a sacrifice, is it? If you're going to present your body a living sacrifice, you know what you're going to have to do? Deny yourself. The sacrifice had to die. Jesus Christ had to hang on that cross and he had to shed his blood and he had to die and he had to be raised the third day to redeem mankind. It was God's plan from the beginning. It was God's perfect plan. Talking about the lamb this morning. Look at verse number 7. The Bible says, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. It's a blood issue. It's always been a blood issue. Since the garden, it's been a blood issue. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. The Bible says that God made them a coat of skins. Who knows you don't get a coat of skins without shedding some blood. It don't work that way. You can believe what you want to. I believe it happened to be a lamb that was slain in that garden for their sin. It's always been about the blood. It's a blood issue. The blood of the lamb was going to help these people. The blood of the lamb was going to deliver these people, this nation, Israel. They could say with their mouth they believe God, but if they didn't apply that blood in that door, somebody's going to die. They could say, yeah, God, I hear you. Yeah, I believed you. But if they didn't kill that lamb and apply that blood at that door, if there was any firstborn in that house, that firstborn was going to die. You can say you believe in God. We can say we love Jesus. We can say we love so-and-so. I remember I was coming out of Walmart one time years ago and trying to give a lady a track. I said, can I give you a gospel track? She said, oh, I love Jesus. I said, well, are you saved? She said, oh, I love Jesus. I said, I'm not asking you if you love Jesus. I'm asking you, have you ever been saved? We can say we know God. But if the blood has not been applied, when you leave this earth, heaven will not be your home. I don't care what you've done. I don't care about your works. I don't care how good you've been. I don't care how much you've given to the cause of, of God. It's a blood issue. Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, And they shall eat the flesh in that night, 
roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden it all with water but roast with fire, his head with his legs and the pertness thereof. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. That which remaineth of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. Fire. Jesus hung on that cross, seven sayings of the cross. What was one of them? He said, I thirst. This was the living water. Thirsted. This is the one that sat on the side of that well with that woman that had wrecked her life, all of her life, and gave her living water. Hung on that cross, and he said, I thirst. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, with your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. The Lord told them, even told them how to eat it. He said, when you eat it, you better be ready because deliverance is coming. He said, have your lawns girty, have your shoes on, be ready. He said, when you eat this Passover, I'm coming through and I'm going to deliver you. I was preparing this. You know what I thought about? Probably what most of you have. <clears throat> I thought about the rapture. It's biblical doctrine. The rapture. One day, Jesus Christ is coming back and he's going to rapture his church all those that have been born again out of this old place. You know what I'm going to tell you this morning? You better be ready. You better be ready. We don't know when it's going to happen. It can happen right now as we speak. I was talking to Brother Tim out there. It's about our turn, turn to cut grass. I said, maybe the Lord will come back. We ain't got to cut that stuff, man. That would be a blessing. But I wonder if he does come back, if somebody here is going to be here to take our turn that weekend. You better be ready. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. The only way these people Firstborn could escape death, certain death, was that the blood must be applied. You know, we hear so many things in radio and television and so many schisms and isms and denominations and people are just bombarded with ways to get to heaven. Jesus Christ said, I am the way. The truth and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. The blood must be applied. Have you applied the blood? Hear people say, well, I wish I had a good job like so-and-so. But have you applied? You know, you ain't going to get the job if you don't apply. Nobody's coming to find you. People want a wife. Young men want a wife. Young men want a husband. Have you applied? I met my wife. I let her know I was interested. <laughs> I applied. Every time she went to open her door, I was standing there about to knock. I applied. <laughs> I was interested. How are you going to get something if you don't apply? Everybody wants to go to heaven. Very rarely you hear anybody say, man, I can't wait to get to hell. Everybody wants to talk about heaven, how good heaven's going to be, and what we're going to do in heaven. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but the question is, have you applied? 
Have you applied the blood? That's what God's looking for, the blood. Not the blood of a bull or of a goat or of a lamb. He's looking for the precious blood of Jesus Christ. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You can't buy your way in. It's not what your family's done. It's not what grandpa was. Your grandpa was a Baptist preacher for 59 years. Praise God. It's not going to get you in. The blood must be applied. I want to take this last few minutes here before we close up <clears throat> and look at the lamb. Look back in verse number 12 with me. Uh, Exodus 12 and 3. The Bible says, Speak ye to all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Y'all see that? That's a lamb. That's what it says, right? People say, oh, every word doesn't matter. You know, we can this and that. and you can every, every, every word. Every word matters. Look at verse 4. And if the household be too little for the lamb. Y'all see that? So we went from a lamb to the lamb, correct? That's what we did. All right, so look at verse number 5 with me. That verse starts off and says, your lamb. So we progress, right? We progress from a lamb to the lamb to your lamb. Well, I see what you're saying, brother, but what's that matter? Now, this old world doesn't have a problem with a lamb. Nothing. Everybody's praying. Every devil is making money off of movies and, and music and rap and whatever else. They're always praying for somebody. Praying. Talking about God. Every athlete on the television that hates God and everything God stands for, they're always thanking God for this and thanking God for that. You know, this whole world, they don't have a problem with a lamb. And some people, they don't even have a problem with the lamb. They realize that there is a way. So a lamb, this whole world's all right with that. A lot of people is pretty good with the lamb. But the problem comes in when it gets down to your lamb. That's where the problem occurs. Because it's you that need a Savior. Uh, sacrifice a lamb? No problem. Pen full of lambs. Bah. <laughs> Little lambs hopping everywhere. It's no big deal. Sure, we'll sacrifice a lamb. Pen full of little lambs running around. It's no big deal, right? That's a lamb. It's no problem. But now, you got to pick one out. That thing's getting a little more real now, right? Which one do you want for your sacrifice, sir? So now you're going to have to pick one out that's going to die. Pen full of lambs, a lamb, no problem. You got to pick one out to pay for your sin, your sacrifice. It's all of a sudden becoming the lamb. That shepherd catches the lamb that you have to pick out. And that little old lamb, he ain't never hurt a soul in this world. Ain't got a mean bone in his body. Meek, gentle, lowly. And he hands that lamb to you. You know what's happening? Boy, that thing's getting real now. Can't you see that little lamb you hold, that little lamb away from the other lambs and scared and 
I can just see that little lamb just trembling. Just trembling in your arms. A lamb, no problem. The lamb, man, that thing's getting real. It's getting tough. But now you know what you have to do? You have to take that lamb to the priest. And you have to hand that lamb over to that priest. And he is your lamb. You know what that priest has got to do? He's going to cut that lamb's throat. And you have to stand there and watch that. You know what that is? That's your lamb. It's not a lamb. It's not the lamb. In order to have those sins forgiven, it's your lamb. He has to die for your sin. And that's where people stop. That's where they stop short. They don't have a problem with a lamb. They love God, 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 God. They don't have a problem with the lamb, Jesus, 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 Jesus. But they have the problem with he hung on that cross and died sinless, never harmed anyone. He died for me, for my sin. And that's where they stop. They don't see their sin as bad as someone else. Yeah, that man down in the prison done those horrible things. He needs that Savior. Yeah, but not me. I'm good. I've done right. I've lived right. I had not hurt people. I've tried to be a good man. They don't, people don't see their sin as exceeding sinful. And until you do, you will never accept Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, as your Lamb. Most people never get to your lamb. My sin didn't put him there. I'm no worse than anyone else. You never think about Jesus Christ hanging on that cross. Is that Jesus Christ hung on that cross willingly and gave his life to pay your sin debt whether you receive it or not. Whether you receive it or not, he hung on that cross willingly to pay your sin debt. You can receive it and be saved and go home to heaven or you can reject it and when your time here is done, you'll go to hell until it's caught up and cast into the lake of fire and you will remain there forever. But whether you accept Jesus or reject Jesus Christ, he hung on that sin debt because of your sin. Listen to what I'm telling you. You cannot hide from God. You cannot. Whether you acknowledge it, whether you admit it, God sees you, He sees your heart, He knows where you've been, He knows what you've done, and He's still willing, despite all of that, if you'll turn to Him by faith and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, He's willing to save your soul right here, right now, this morning. You know what He is? He is a merciful graceful, loving God. And if you receive Him as your Savior, He'll save your soul. You'll be eternally secure and heaven will be your home forever. But you listen to what I'm telling you. If you reject Jesus Christ, if you reject that Lamb, you're going to stand before Him one day and those eyes are going to be as a flame of fire and there will be no mercy. There will be no grace. It'll be judgment. It'll be right. It'll be just. And you'll have to suffer punish, punishment for eternity. Do you know how much God doesn't want that? God doesn't want that happen enough. He was willing to hang his son on a cross to shed his blood and give his life that you and I, the wretched, miserable sinners that we are, he was willing to give the just for the unjust that we might be saved. Amen. Nothing in my hands I bring simply to the cross I cling. And it's just as simple as putting your faith and trust, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. If he'd have made it some great feat, we couldn't have done it. 
We wouldn't have enough money. We wouldn't have enough energy. We wouldn't have enough status. If he didn't make it some great feat, we couldn't have done it. But he made it simple enough that a child can do it. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and confessed with your mouth, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. You see little children come down and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And you see adults, grown people, and they've grown so hard and they've heard it so much and you wonder, why won't they come? The Bible says Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. It's not about just a lamb. It's not about just the lamb. That lamb has to be your lamb. Hands bowed and eyes closed this morning. (laughs) Tell you, he loves you. Mm, He loves you. And the Lamb loves you enough to give his life. Won't you come this morning? Maybe you need to come to do business with the Lamb. Once you come.